Um, first of all, you hear financial management, managerial finance, corporate finance. Those are all the same thing, so don't let that difference in nomenclature mess you up. So let's talk about how we're going to examine, uh, in fact, we're going to build our entire semester off this, this concept, and that is we're going to use the balance sheet model of the firm. What are the, the three big things you see on the balance sheet? Over here on this side, we have something called assets. And then over on this side, we have two things. What are they? Liabilities, equity. Liabilities and owner's equity. If I say I owe someone money, which of those three places does it go? Liabilities. If I talk about the shareholders, where are they showing up at? Yeah, the owner's equity. And the assets are anything that's owned by the firm that is expected to produce future economic value or economic benefit to the firm. And so we've got all sorts of assets, but basically if we take all the assets and we sell all the liabilities and use the, or so if we sell all the assets and use the money to pay off the liabilities, what's left is the equity. Does that make sense? Hopefully you guys remember this. I actually had a student come to Come to my office and say, uh, owner's equity, that's just another form of liabilities, isn't it? No, no. Owner's equity is an ownership position. Liability is debt. Now, in corporate finance, we're going to try to answer three big questions. And the first one is, what long-term assets should be purchased by the firm? Remember we said assets are anything the firm owns that is expected to provide future economic benefit. Should we just go out and buy any old assets? No, we need to pick which ones we're going to buy. And we call that process by which we're going to choose those, we call that capital budgeting. Capital has the feeling or smell of long term, because we'll talk about capital budgeting, capital financing, but in this case we're talking about budgeting of our capital in order to purchase assets. The second question is, now that we've figured out what assets we want to buy, we need to figure out how we're going to pay for it. And it's a question of basically debt or equity, debt or equity. And we call this question the capital structure question. The capital structure question. In fact, I want you to write this down. The capital structure is the mix of debt and equity that are used to finance the assets of the firm. The capital structure is the mix of debt and equity that are used to finance the assets of the firm. So number one is what are we gonna buy? Number two is how are we gonna pay for it? By the way, number two, do you think we face that own decision or that decision in our own lives? How many of you go to the car dealership to buy a car and then one of the questions that inevitably comes up is how are you gonna pay, right? And what are your big two options there? Yeah, so when we say finance, what we mean is to borrow money, right? So that's gonna be a liability. What's the other way that we could finance that? Just pay cash for it, right? Or write a check. And you might do a mixture of both. And we see that that's exactly what happens in corporate America. Most corporations have a mixture of debt and equity. I have a, a asset that I finance with a mix of equity and debt. The only thing I owe money on is my house. Um, and I had to pay 20% down and then 80% was the debt. Now I'm paying it down. Finally broke below 200,000, yay! By the way, my mortgage debt is financed at 3.375%. Do you think I'm in a hurry to pay that off quickly? No, in fact, what I'm doing is waiting for the inflation to make the dollars that I'm gonna pay it back with worth far less. Does that make sense? And so uh, I, I grew up on a farm and we have a very dim view of debt because uh, it creates some problems. But anyway, uh, it, the idea was pay everything off as soon as you possibly can. And it's just not mathematically the wisest path. It's really hard for me to, to uh, work through that. Okay, so we all have capital structure in our own lives. And then finally, we have how do we manage the short-term operating cash flows of the firm? Short-term. In accounting and finance, 
Uh, when we say short term, what do we mean? Within a one year. Yeah, within a year, right? And so what we're talking about is basically our current assets, current liabilities, those sorts of things. In fact, if we take current assets minus current liabilities, we actually call that something. What is it? Uh, current assets minus current liabilities is called, I'll give you a, a hint. It starts with, yeah, working capital or net working capital. You'll hear them used interchangeably. And so the question is, how are we gonna manage these short-term cash flows. Do you have these own things in your own life? Do you have working capital management issues in your own life? Do you have short-term expenses? How many of you have rent or a mortgage payment? Yeah, you've got short-term expenses. Um, do you also have money coming in periodically? Yeah, you've got, uh, so your job, you can think of as being a current asset that's gonna spit some money back at you. And so you guys have to do this too. And what you always wanna wind up with is a positive balance in your checking account at the end of the month. Does that make sense? It's the same with a business. And uh, some people would look at these three and they would say, well, certainly capital budgeting is sexier than working capital management. That's just you know, balancing your checkbook, number three. And then they might say, well, number two is sexier because you're dealing with investment banks and you're swinging billions of dollars around. Certainly that's got to be sexier. But I would tell you that number three is the most important question in corporate finance. Can anyone tell me why? Would this be more consistent on day-to-day -day operations for a business person? Okay. Uh, we're going to call that a swing and a mess, but I appreciate you playing. Is it because it deals with cash flows? Yes, but why? what kind of cash flows? Operating cash flows. Okay, so we're talking the short term. Why would the short term be more important than the long term? Is this being going to be Say again. Within a year. Within a year, okay. Yeah. But why would the short term be more important than the long term? Let me ask you this question. Uh, so I'll, tell, I'll give you an example here. Uh, my wife and I are planning for retirement, and it's only 14 and a half years away. Woohoo! Um, so we're planning for retirement, and uh, we're putting a lot of thought into that. So that's kind of the capital budgeting question, right? We're figuring out what assets to buy to fund our retirement. But in the meantime, if I step out in front of a bus and get hit by said bus, am I going to get to retire? No. So my point here is, if you don't take care of the short term, there is no long term. That's why number three to me is the most important. If you don't take care of the short term, there is no long term. Why do companies go bankrupt? Very simple, very simple thinking. What, are, what causes a company to have to enter into bankruptcy? Okay, so in, in actuality, we're talking about, that's, that's part of it, but what if they continue to borrow money, right? It's when they run out of cash, when they run out of cash. If you could keep getting idiots to loan you money, you could stay in business for a long, long time. Example, General Motors. Right? They stayed in business for a long time before they went bankrupt simply because they kept getting people to buy their stock, buy their bonds. And so the point here is it's when you run out of cash. And so this last thing is making sure that you have enough cash to pay your bills, right? And if you don't take care of that, you go bankrupt and then you are out of the game, game over. Does that make sense? Okay, any questions on the three so you need to remember the three questions. You'll need to be able to identify what different things would be, which category it would go into. And you'll need to remember uh, the, the name for the question. So the first thing I do is I think, oh, the names all have the word capital in them. And from there, it's really easy. It's capital budget and capital structure and working capital management. Now I'm gonna throw some examples here at you. And I want you to tell me which question we're talking about. Uh, example number one, should we uh, use debt or equity to finance the construction of a new factory? Next question. 
capital yeah, it's capital structure. structure. Should we build our, should we build a new factory or should we expand a current factory with some different machinery? Capital, capital, capital budgeting. How much money should we keep in the checking account? Work in capital, capital management. Um, how quickly should I pay my suppliers? Work in capital management, right? Okay. Now let's talk about the organization. And this is this is kind of an old line organization. Things things have moved along a little bit, but there are still a lot of companies out here that look just like this. Up at the top, we have the board of directors. And a lot of people get confused and think the board of directors are actually managers of the firm. Occasionally you will see managers on the board of directors, but in truth, the board of directors are representatives of the shareholders. By the way, the shareholders are the owners of the firm. Owners of the firm are the ones who get to make decisions at the firm. Therefore, the shareholders get to make the decisions. Unfortunately, there are a boatload of shareholders for most firms. There are just an astronomical amount of them. And so it wouldn't make sense for, by the way, I'm a shareholder in like 1,100 companies. Would it make sense for me to be involved in the day-to-day -day decision making of any of those companies? No. Um, so here's what we do. We as shareholders elect a board of directors and the board of directors are supposed to represent our interests. What do the board of directors do? Well, they've got three main jobs. They hire the managers of the firm. They compensate the managers of the firm and they fire the managers of the firm. What do we mean by compensate? Mr. Ali. Yeah, how are we gonna pay them? Okay, we'll talk in the agency problem about how, how we pay people changes their behavior. Okay, so we got the board of directors and usually what they do is they go out and they basically hire the CEO or chief executive officer. And then they let the chief executive officer bring in their own people to work underneath them. Of course, the board of directors would have to bless those hirings, but why do you think they would let the CEO choose their own subordinates? Anybody in here play a team sport? Where's my hockey people? Yeah. You play a team sport. Would you rather work with a group of randoms or play with a group of random strangers or the people that you've trained with? Uh, people you train with. Yeah, people you train with, people you trust, right? Or at least you know when not to trust them. Does that make sense? And so if we uh, let a CEO hire their own team, and it's far more likely it'll be successful. Does that make sense? Okay, now here it says chairman of the board and chief executive officer. Those do not always have to be the same. In fact, we recommend that they aren't, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the agency problem. Underneath that, we have the chief operating officer. The chief operating officer is handling those day-to-day -day decisions. And so what's the difference between CEO and COO? The CEO is the visionary. The CEO is looking out into the future, deciding uh, what directions the business should go into, what new markets we should get into, what markets we should get out of, what should we, what should we exit. And so they're out there, they're thinking primarily externally. The chief operating officer, on the other hand, is thinking primarily internally. And so they're trying to make sure that everything happens correctly at the company every day. And so they're taking the marching orders from the CEO and they're turning it into reality. Now, underneath, the chief operating officer is the vice president and chief financial officer. We'll just call it the CFO. And it doesn't even have to have the term vice president. And the CFO is the top ranking financial employee at the firm. The CFO is the top ranking financial employee at the firm. And there are two different positions that report to her. Number one would be the treasurer and number two would be the controller. Let's start over on the controller side. And controller is an anglicization of this word. Which is 
actually French. And it looks like controller, and Americans will pronounce it that way, but if you pronounce it with correct French, it's a, a, a here, it's controller, I don't speak French. So, this is how we get into C-O-N-T-R-O-L-L-E-R, -L -L -E and it's a little, it's kind of a misnomer because people think, oh, this person controls the firm. They don't. They're just the top accountant at the firm. So write that down. The controller is the top accountant at the firm. And then underneath the controller, uh, we've got some additional positions. First of all, we have the tax manager. By the way, do you think there are different uh, things we could do at the firm that could legally reduce our taxes? Yeah, there are a lot of things you can do. I'll give you an example. Um, last in, first out versus first in, first out accounting is one of those ways that we can um, legally minimize our taxes. By the way, do you think it's our responsibility to legally reduce our taxes? Yeah, who are we responsible to in the end? The shareholders. Who gets the benefit of the tax savings if we don't overpay our taxes? The shareholders. And so that's why your tax manager is important. The other reason is if the tax manager does their job incorrectly, the CFO and the COO can wind up in, starts with a P, prison. And if you guys are under the misconception that federal prison is like a day camp, let me know and I'll bring my buddy in who did seven years. He can share with you how rough federal prison really is. Okay, so we like the tax manager, we want him to do it legally because we don't want to go to jail. Then we have the cost accounting manager. You might think that sounds like the easiest job in the world because we know, well, we bought this ton of raw materials and we know how much it costs. And costs like that are really easy to figure out. But what about when we have to distribute other costs across departments? For instance, we've got the electricity in this building. How many departments do we have operating in this building? I think it's like five. Uh, how do we divide up that electricity among the departments? So these are the kinds of questions that the, the cost accounting manager is answering, and they're actually far more uh, complex than what I'm just telling you. Then we have the financial accounting manager. Every three months, publicly traded corporations in the United States are required to file their financial statements with the Securities and Exchange Commission. And the financial accounting manager is responsible for putting those things together. Now, once again, if you are sending paperwork to the government, do you think it's important to get it right? Yeah. I actually know a uh, financial accounting manager for Universal Studios, the, the theme parks. Do you think he sleeps well? No, he wants to make sure everything is clean because of course he doesn't want to go to jail either. And then finally we have the information systems manager. Now, this is gonna look weird to some of you because the idea of having the computer people under the accounting people is foreign these days because computers are used in every single aspect of the operation. However, if you roll with me back to 1964, uh, in 1963, my mom becomes a high school math teacher. In 1964, she says, forget that, because kids suck. In 1964, she becomes a bookkeeper at at a local uh, stone quarry. That's where they dig the stone out of the ground, right? So she becomes the a bookkeeper there. And one of her jobs is to uh, take care of and feed this brand new thing called a computer. And what does it do? The only thing it was doing when she started there was to put together the bills to send out in the mail. Now that is accounts receivable. And so that would be an accounting function. And so originally the computer only served accounting. And then people figured out, well, hey, we can track all of our transactions on the computer and we can actually use it to help put together what we call a rough draft of our balance sheet, and income statement, that sort of stuff. And so for the longest time, the computer was the domain of the accountants only within the last, well, let's say 30 years has it been more widespread across the industry. Um, 1992 is the first time I had a 
desktop computer of my own that we actually were able to do other things with other than just enter accounting data. Okay, now today, would we see this so much? No, we're probably gonna see a CIO. What does CIO stand for? Chief Information Officer. Yeah, Chief Information Officer, most likely. So, but there are still companies out here that are organized like that. Now, uh, chapter one, by the way, is what I would call a potpourri. It's a mix of all sorts of stuff that doesn't go anywhere else. And so we're going to make an abrupt change right now. We're going to talk about limited versus limited. If the firm's equity investors, also known as the shareholders, are responsible for all the debts of the firm, regardless of how big they are, then we would say they have unlimited liability. So let's talk about how one would get, un or, or what would happen. Let's say that you get sued for doing something bad, and you wind up with a huge judgment against you. And the judgment is much larger than the equity of the firm you still have to pay the entire amount of the judgment. We'll do an example of that here in a minute. Limited liability is much better. Equity investors only lose up to the amount they had invested in the firm. They are not on the hook for the entire amount of the debts, only what they've already invested. Would you rather have limited liability or unlimited liability? Limited liability, very good. Now, just to drive that point home, I'm going to tell you a quick story here. My wife and I get to Mississippi. I've decided I no longer want to mow my yard. And so I hire a local guy. And he, uh, basically, he has three assets. He has his pickup truck, he has a trailer, and he has this amazing $10,000 zero turning radius GPS enabled lawnmower. That's really what his assets are. Okay, now he is out mowing my yard one day and he's got his earbuds in, he's jamming out to ACDC and suddenly he feels the lawnmower shudder. <clears throat> and he looks all over my yard and he sees blood and white fur. He wonders what he's hit, but it doesn't take him long to figure out when he turns around and sees my neighbor's wife and their three little kids standing there watching with looks of horror on their face. Now, Mark quickly realizes what's happened and he shuts down the mower and he's like, oh ma'am, I am so sorry. Do you think that's gonna be enough? No, of course not. Now, here's what you need to know about the dog who went by the name Fluffy. Fluffy's real name was Sir William Fluffmeister, and he's like some sort of champion show dog. And he's retired, and he's currently what they call out to stud. If you guys don't know what that means, check it out. It's a pretty sweet gig. Now, so Fluffy has been out to stud, and so Fluffy has a market value of $50,000. Do you think Mark's gonna get by with just paying $50,000 to replace the economic value of this dog? No, why not? The kids witnessed it. There's all this emotional trauma and distress that's been caused by this event. And because this is America, and in particular Mississippi, people like to sue. And so, uh, as, as it turns out, she sues Mark, or the, the, the dog's dad actually sued Mark, and it goes to court. By the way, Mark doesn't have any insurance, which is not uncommon for guys with lawnmowers, right? Okay, so here's what happens. They go to court, and the lawyer for the dog makes an impassioned plea. He says, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, by the way, that's my Mississippi accent. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, certainly as fellow Mississippians and dog lovers, we can all agree that this dog was no mere dog. This dog was more like a brother to these little children. This dog was a member of the family. 
Certainly the loss of this dog in such a horrible and traumatic fashion deserves more than just $50,000. Certainly the loss of this beloved family member is worth at least $2 million. The jury deliberates. They come back and they have the decision. And they read the decision to the judge. And the decision is that Mark needs to pay the family $2 million. So apparently the dog's lawyer did a great job. Now, here's the judge. By the way, the judge sounds strangely like the lawyer because I only have one Mississippi accent, right? $2 million, why that's, that's a disgrace. We are going to reduce that to $1 million. Now, is Mark happy? Do you think he has even $1 million? No. And so what's gonna happen here? Well, first of all, Mark goes home to his wife and she says, how did it go in court today? He said, well, we lost. And she says, how bad is it? And he says, $1 million. And she says, well, I guess you're gonna lose your business. And he says, oh, it's worse than that because I have unlimited liability, we're going to lose the business, we're going to lose the house, we're going to lose the kid's college fund, and we're going to be on the hook for this money until we die. Does that sound like a good deal? No. Now, could Mark have avoided this situation? He absolutely could have, and I'm going to teach you how to do that. But first, I'm going to let you off the hook. This never happened. Fluffy lived a long and full life, passed on in his old age with fond memories of his days as a stud. By the way, I promise you, I, so I'm gonna tell you lots of bullshit stories here to illustrate points, but I promise you I will always tell you at the end whether or not they were bullshit. Well, that one was bullshit. For the most part, you know, the dog actually did exist, right? Okay. And I actually had a young lady sitting on the front row and she's crying while I'm telling the story. I'm like, oh, honey, stop. It's all bullshit, right? <laughs> okay. So, have I convinced you that you don't want unlimited liability? Yeah. Would you like to know how to avoid it? Absolutely. So let's talk about that. It's in the legal form you choose for your firm. It's in the legal form you choose for your firm. And we're gonna discuss four different kinds of legal forms for firms here. There are more than just that, but this is the, the big stuff, the important stuff to get you started. And the first one we're gonna talk about is the sole proprietorship. What do you think sole means? Yeah, it's just one. So this is a one owner firm. A proprietor is an owner. A sole proprietorship is a one owner firm. What about a partnership? Two yeah, two or more, right? Yeah. Uh, or we could say more one. than one, right? Either way, it means the same thing. Two or more. And then we have uh, the limited liability company. Have you ever heard of LLC? Yeah, that's, that stands for limited liability company. Occasionally you'll hear people erroneously refer to it, and occasionally I slip on the tongue too and call it a limited liability corporation. It is not. It is not a corporation, it is just a company. And that brings us to the corporation, which is the one that we're most familiar with because that's the big stuff that we see every day. Google, Coca-Cola, things like that. And we're gonna talk about each one of these things along several dimensions. First of all, does it have limited liability? Uh, what's the taxation situation there? Is it easy to transfer ownership? And then there's this thing called perpetual succession. And perpetual succession just means that the company lives on by itself forever unless it goes out of business or the owners decide to shut it down. So that's perpetual succession. And then we're gonna talk about whether it's easy to raise capital, which we talked about being long-term funds uh, for the firm, and is it easy to start? <coughs> so let's start with a sole proprietorship. This is what Mark was, and it does not have limited liability. If it doesn't have limited liability, that means it has unlimited liability. Should you desire to be a sole proprietor? No. Sole proprietorships are very dangerous. So you ask yourself, 
why would anyone be a sole proprietor? Well, let's, let's go all the way to the end here and talk about how easy it is to start. Yesterday, we had snow on the ground. And for some reason, people around here aren't content to just let nature do its job. They want it shoveled. And so you take advantage of this, you take your shovel out, and you start charging people $40 to shovel their walk or whatever price you arrive at. Now, the water, a little, we had some sunshine yesterday, the water melts, gets back on the sidewalk, becomes very slick. And then uh, this morning, one of your clients got up, slipped, fell, and broke a hip. And they come to you and say, wait a minute, uh, because of what you did, I ended up breaking my hip. And you say, oh, here's your $40 back. Do you think that's gonna be good enough? No, so what are they gonna do? They're going to sue you. And you're going to have unlimited liability because you are a sole proprietor. You say, wait a minute, I don't remember registering as a sole proprietor. You don't have to. You don't have to. You automatically become a sole proprietor unless you do one of these other forms. That's why the most numerous, most popular form of business in the United States is sole proprietor, because you can do it accidentally. And there will be an exam question like this, and it'll say, what's the most numerous or popular form of, uh, co of company in the United States? And students will all mark corporations, because that's what they're familiar with, but in reality, it's sole proprietors. Sole proprietors are the most numerous. Now, they've only got one employee, or they've only got one owner apiece, but there are the most of those. Okay, now to talk about double taxation, let's talk about, we have to skip forward to corporations. At the corporation, uh, there are things called corporate income taxes. And so the corporation has to pay those, and then what's left over is net income. And that net income can be used then to pay out dividends. The dividends are paid to the tax, to the uh, shareholders. And then those dividends are also taxed. And so you might start out with a dollar of earnings and 35 cents of that goes to corporate taxes and now we have 65 cents left over to be paid to the shareholder. And then after the shareholder gets that money, they might have to pay 20 cents or 20% of that in dividend taxes. And so now 20% of 65 cents, I believe is 13 cents. And so it brings us down to 52 cents out of that original dollar actually winds up in the owners of the firm's pockets. So does double taxation sound like a great deal? No, it sounds like a pretty raw deal. At least sole proprietors do not have double taxation. So how's the sole proprietor taxed? Sole proprietors are taxed on the profits of their firm like it was regular income. Just like the money that the university pays me with one difference. The university is paying half of my social security and Medicare. Those are called payroll taxes. When you have your own business, guess what folks? You've got to pay those. And so let's say I'm paying seven and a half percent. He's paying 15%, the sole proprietor. But other than that, the taxes are exactly the same for uh, a sole proprietor and for me. So there's no double taxation. Is it easy to transfer ownership of a sole proprietorship? And this is where students get confused and get uh, confuse the assets of the business with the value of the business. So let's talk about Mark. Mark has his truck. Oh, that's the lawn mowing guy. Did I tell you that? Mark's his name. Uh, he has his truck, his lawnmower, and his trailer. 10,000 bucks, maybe. No, no, we got 20,000 because we had said the lawnmower was 10,000 by itself. $20,000 market value of the assets. Do you think that's what his firm is worth? Do you think if he were to turn around and sell his business as a going concern, he could only get twenty thousand dollars for it? She says no. Why not? Because he has customers. Yeah. Yeah. There's more to this business thing than just the asset, right? By the way, Mark was well known. He does a good job. He has a pretty big client list, 
And by the way, people that pay other people to mow their yards typically aren't around in the daytime to see who mows their yard anyway. So all someone has to do is buy Mark's business, they get his client list, and as long as they don't anchor those clients, they can probably keep them. By the way, finding a good lawn guy is a real pain in the butt. I plan to replace mine with a robot as soon as I can. He knows, he's, he's cool with it, he's tired of it, right? Okay. So, uh, now the next question though is, do you think Mark knows what his company is actually worth? No, small business owners have no idea typically what their business is actually worth. So would they know how much to ask for the business? No, so what do they do? Well, they can hire a consultant and the consultant for a fee will give them an appraisal of the firm. So now they know what to ask. Now, do you think it's really easy to just uh, sell your business, uh, find someone, and, and let's talk about Mark. You have to have someone who wants to be mowing lawns in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, who's not already doing it. Do you think that's a big population? No. And so Mark's gonna engage someone called a broker. And the broker, by the way, real estate brokers, they do this work in exchange for something. Start with a C. Yeah, commission. And the real estate commission here in, the, in Missouri is around 6%. For businesses, it's around 10%. And so Mark is gonna have to pay this consultant, and then he's gonna pay the broker 10%, assuming he sells the business. Now, even after all of that, he is still better off than if he had just sold his mower, his truck, and his trailer. But it's gonna take some time. It's gonna take some time. It's probably gonna be like three to six months. So, is it easy to transfer ownership of this whole proprietorship? Absolutely not. Is there perpetual succession? No. When the owner dies, that sole proprietorship ends. Now, some of you know people who have died and left their business to their kids. That's great. The kid now becomes a new sole proprietorship with that business. The original sole proprietorship is gone and done because it died with the original owner. What about easy capital raising? So let's talk about, I'll give you an example of my current lawn guy who's, who's grown up since then. He was one of my former students and we've been together for 13 years now as far as he, him as my lawn man. And he started out very small. It was just him. And he graduated, by the way, he had an entrepreneurship major. So you know he wants to go out and start his own business. And he goes down to the bank because he doesn't have any money, he doesn't have enough money to do what he wants to do. He goes down to the bank and he talks to the commercial loan officer. And the commercial loan officer says, what can I do for you? He says, I have a dream. And the commercial loan officer says, tell me your dream. He said, I want to have the best landscaping company in all of Springfield, Missouri, and perhaps eventually open up a branch in St. Louis. And the, the loan officer says, wow, that's a great dream. He says, what do you need to get started? And my student says, well, I have my pickup truck and my trailer. I just need the $10,000 zero turn radius lawnmower. And he says, so I need to borrow uh, the money for that. And the loan officer says, that's great. He says, how much money do you currently have? At which point my student says, none. What do you think happened next? He didn't get the loan. And there was something said about not letting the door hit him on the way out, right? So they're, yeah, they're not gonna, not gonna want anything to do with him. So it's really hard for him to raise capital. Uh, he can't go out and sell shares, and he, you probably don't want to ask your parents, relatives, friends, right? So it's really limited, the capital raising. And so he goes down to the lawnmower dealership, and he's standing there in front of the lawnmower he desired. The tears are streaming down his face. I'm actually exaggerating this point. This is the bullshit part. The tears are streaming down his face, and the salesperson comes up to him and says, What's wrong? And my student says, well, he said, I wanted to buy this lawnmower to start my 
landscaping empire, but the bank won't loan me the money. And the salesperson says, don't worry. Why do you think the salesman is telling him not to worry? Uh, he's gonna let him buy the yeah, so he's gonna arrange financing. Why would the dealership arrange financing when the bank wouldn't? What is the dealership getting out of this other than interest? Long-term customer. A long-term customer, very good. What else? Commission. Commission, okay, so the salesperson's getting a commission. What's the dealership getting? Profit from the sale, right? And so they're more motivated to help this guy out than the bank. Does that make sense? Okay, so uh, do you think such financing is low cost? No. Do you think now that he's an established business guy with, you know, let's just say he has $100,000 in cash that he can work with, do you think that he goes to that kind of financing anymore? No. He's got a banker that wants to do business with him. Not the same guy that told him to get out before the door hit him. Okay, so that's why we say it's not easy for them to cap raise capital. But sole proprietorship, we've already said it's easy to start. You can do it without even knowing that you've done it. Okay, now we're on to the partnership. And a partnership looks a whole lot like a sole proprietorship, except for there's more than one person. Um, and so it has, uh, it does not have limited liability. And that's even a bigger problem now because that means the partnership, the legal entity of the partnership is on the hook for the entire debts of the partnership. Now, let's assume, uh, I'm gonna assume that uh, because I am 50 plus years old, professional, and you are students, uh, I'm gonna look at you, Ms. Minahan. Um, I'm going to assume you don't have a lot of wealth. That's correct. Okay. So, so here I am. I've got, uh, I won't tell you how much, but I've got plenty. Anyway, so, uh, as she's already told us, she has nothing. So, we, <laughs> we decided to go into business together. And uh, we do something stupid. And we're not going to blame Ms. Minahan or me for it. It just happened, right? We get, we get blamed for something and we get sued and the lawsuit comes around and we're going to have to pay a million bucks. We have unlimited liability. We've got to pay the whole million. Now I say, well, Ms. Minahan, looks like you're gonna have to cough up 500,000 bucks. What does Ms. Minahan say? Oh, good luck. Yeah, it's like getting blood from a turnip, right? Come on. Okay, that's not gonna happen. So what does that mean about me? Who's gonna have to pay the whole million bucks? I will. So knowing that, if you are poor, should you seek to find a partner that has a lot of money? Yeah. If you are rich, should you avoid poor partners? Yeah. Now, do you think the same idea could be applied to marriage? Hey folks, it's a, it's a legally, economically binding contract, right? It's a partnership. My wife and I are partners. Now, the cool thing is we both started off with the same amount that Ms. Minahan has. Nothing, right? And so it's, everything is basically stuff that we've created together. But if you start off as rich and you get into a partnership with a poor person, you could find yourself in a world of hurt down the road. Okay, let's see. Um, now, let's talk about double taxation. No. Uh, in fact, the profits of the partnership are divvied up according to the partnership agreement, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But then, uh, whatever you get is just taxed as regular income. Of course, you have to pay the extra payroll taxes. It's even more difficult to transfer ownership with a partnership. I'll give you an example. Ms. Minahan and I are, have been in business for 14 years now. I am 65. What do you think I've got on my mind? Retirement. I say, okay, Ms. Minahan, we need, to, we need to sell this business and get out of it. What does she say? I'm only, what do you mean, 36, 37? Sure, we'll say I'm, I'm gonna be 24, so. Oh, so you're 24 plus, 14 is 38, oh, right? 
And so that means you've got another, what, 27 years to work if you go to 65? Do you think she's going to be interested in selling? No. So now we've got this whole fight. And so that's one of the things you want to cover in the partnership agreement that we're going to talk about is um, how do we handle that situation? Typically, what would happen is Ms. Man Minahan and I would both have right of first refusal. If one of us wants to sell our part of the partnership, then the other one would have the right to buy it at either a price stated in the um, partnership agreement, which I wouldn't recommend because of inflation, or uh, you guys could get an, agree to get an appraisal and 50% of that, right? And then if the partner couldn't afford that, the remaining partner, then uh, they could go, you could go ahead and sell yours to anybody, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, um, if I sell out and Ms. Minahan, I sell to someone else, this is now a new partnership. Also, if I die, I'm the more likely one of us to die because I'm old and male. Um, I'm the more likely one to die. She's probably gonna be the one left over. Uh, the partnership though is officially dead. The partnership dies as soon as one of the partners dies. So therefore we say it does not have perpetual succession. Um, is it easy to raise capital for a partnership? It's actually not easy, but it's easier than a sole proprietorship. Any idea why? That depends on the financial capacity of the partners. Exactly. So in the beginning, if you're just a sole proprietor, you have your own savings that you can invest as equity in the firm. But uh, now we are going to go into business together and it's not just my wealth, it's your wealth that can serve as equity to go into the firm. The second reason that it's easier for a partnership to raise capital is that banks are much more willing to lend to two people rather than one. Any idea why? Security. Say again? Security. Okay, yes. I was going to say less risk. Yeah, but why is it less risk? Let's say if you're a sole proprietorship and you get hit by a bus. I'm being really hard on buses today, but let's say you get hit by a bus. Who's going to pay? Nobody. If you are a, you, you and a partner um, are borrowing the money, and let's say I get hit by a bus, who's left over to pay? Ms. Minahan, right? And if she can keep that business going, right, she's going to continue to pay that debt. And so bankers are much more willing to work with you because number one, uh, there's more wealth to serve as basically skin in the game, equity. And number two, uh, it's basically a more diversified portfolio of borrowers. What are the chances that they're both going to uh, be out of commission at the same time? Okay. Is it easy to start a partnership? Well, it's easy, but it's not as easy as a sole proprietorship because we have to have a partnership agreement, or at the very least, we should. Right? You very least we should. And that partnership agreement needs to spell out who's contributing what to the partnership and what percent of the proceeds go to each partner. So I had this friend, Cesar, and he was opening a Mexican restaurant. Now Cesar was, was our waiter at one place. And I told him, I said, look, you're, you're way too smart to be a waiter the rest of your life. And he said, I know. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, no, can do a restaurant. I said, where in the world are you getting the money? He says, my uncle just sold some real estate in California. He's moving here and he's going to be my partner. And so the uncle who knew nothing about restaurants was putting up the money. Cesar was putting up the expertise. In the beginning, they agreed to split the proceeds 50-50. By the way, Cesar was going to run the joint too. So they agreed to split the proceeds 50-50. And the uncle is supposed to come, you know, kind of help things along. Um, but what happens is the uncle basically sits, and this is a true story, the uncle basically sits around and drinks margaritas and chews on a toothpick all day. And so when they went to open no, store number two, by the way, store number one successful because Cesar works his tail off. Store number two, what do you think the split was this time? I think it's still 50-50? Cesar, Cesar says, no, we're going to do 70-30. What do you think the uncle's going to say? You say no, but what's the uncle putting into it? Nothing. Nothing. 
Nada, I like that in Spanish, right? Nada, he's putting in nada. What, which, which would you rather have, 30% or nothing for doing nothing? Yeah, so the uncle took the 30%, right? So the, the, the trick here is, is that you need to have these things really lined up. Should there have been some sort of clause in there about the expectations for what the uncle is supposed to do at the restaurant? Yeah, there should have been expectations for everybody outlined in there. Okay, now, if you're gonna do one of these agreements, what kind of professional do you think you should have involved in, in putting it together? Lawyer. lawyer. Anybody in here wanna be a lawyer? Good, because I've already told you I'm not gonna write you a letter, right? Uh, lawyers, uh, what's the primary people? Primary reason people want to become lawyers? Is it because they want to be well liked by society at large? No, what is it? Money! Are lawyers cheap? No, and so we're gonna to have to, first of all, work through these difficult issues. Secondly, we're gonna to have to pay some expensive lawyers to draw this stuff up. So it's not as easy to start a partnership as it is to start a sole proprietorship. Now let's talk about the Limited Liability Company or LLC. It has it in the name. Yes, it has limited liability. And the limited liability company, I want you to think of it as, and once again, I'm a terrible artist, but um, we have a cake here. That's cake. And this cake underneath could either be a sole proprietorship or a partnership, doesn't matter. What I'm trying to get around to telling you is that this LLC is the icing that we put on that cake. You can take any sole proprietorship and get rid of your unlimited liability simply by putting the icing of an LLC over the top. You can take any partnership and turn it into an LLC and do the same thing. And so all the underlying stuff will be the same, like the partnership agreement and all that sort of stuff. And then we just put the LLC over the top of it. Yes. What does that mean for a company's funds? For a company's funds. Or as far as making money. Oh, uh, your ability to make money is uh, only impacted by the fee that you pay to get the LLC. Because everything else stays the same. You're basically just getting rid of your unlimited liability. Everything else stays the same. Now, is it easy? We're going to skip down to the end here because we all the other answers are exactly the same depending on whether it's sole proprietorship or partnership underneath all this icing. Is it easy to start? It's actually pretty easy. And here's why. Does, has anyone in here got an LLC? Okay, so I actually have an LLC. Don't be impressed. It's really easy. You could set one up this afternoon. Here's what you need. You need $50. You need a credit card, you need an email address, and you need a postal address. And you need access to the internet because you're gonna to go to the Missouri Secretary of State's website and you're going to set up your LLC. You could do it in probably 20 to 30 minutes. Is there any excuse, knowing what it takes to become an LLC, is there any excuse for anybody to be a sole proprietor? There is no excuse whatsoever. Um, so I'm giving this talk to a group of China EMBA students. And they were beyond belief when I told them that they were sole, sole proprietors. They said, how could anybody be so stupid as to not go ahead and do the LLC thing? And I said, it, it happens. Fortunately, that afternoon, three of these students are sitting in my office when an old student and current friend of mine drops by a visit, his name's Nick. And Nick is an entrepreneur. And Nick drops in and he's telling me about his latest project. He has opened a small store selling handicrafts from his homeland. And uh, he's really excited about it. He's telling me about how many square feet his store is and this, that, and the other. And I ask him, I said, so Nick, are you a sole proprietor? And it was really interesting to watch what happened next. All of the color left his face and his jaw dropped open and he said, no, he knew from my class that he needed, that he needed the LLC, but is, is he's an entrepreneur. What's he passionate about? I'm gonna rent the building. I'm gonna decorate it in the stuff of my homeland. I'm gonna make sure I've got the right stuff on the shelves. I'm gonna advertise it. I've just got all sorts of things to do. The LLC just slid off the back of the, the back burner. 
my Chinese students were absolutely shocked. And after he left, they said, well, I guess people really can be that stupid. <laughs> He's not stupid. You just get excited about doing your thing, right? So here's what you do. When you sit down and you think, I'm going to start a business, the first thing you do is go out and set up your LLC. And so uh, mine has a very, the, the name is German because all the good English ones are taken. So I go out there and I just set this up. Do I know what I'm going to do with it at the time? No. Uh, first, I thought I was going to do uh, print-on-demand t-shirts and mugs and things like that because I've got some really dirty jokes I like to put out there. But uh, then some things went wrong in that. And then I've also got my YouTube channel. And if they ever monetize me, maybe that's what I do with my LLC. I've also thought about doing some consulting work. That's something I can do with my LLC. But whatever I do, I've already got it. Does that make sense? So if you have an inkling that you're about to... Uh, start a business, go ahead and set up your LLC. That way you'll have it done. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, finally, let's talk about the corporation. Uh, does the corporation have limited liability? Yes. And the, what that, does that mean? It means that as a shareholder, the most you'll ever lose is what you paid for your shares. Limited liability is the reason that share prices can never go below zero. Let me say that again. Limited liability is the reason that share prices can never go below zero because the most you can lose is the amount that you paid for the shares. Now, is there double taxation? Yes. Remember we said there's the corporate taxes and then there's the dividend taxes. Is it easy to transfer ownership in a um, corporation? Absolutely. I have 10 shares of General Electric and I am tired of the crappy job that they're doing. How can I sell my piece of General Electric? Anybody in here have a brokerage account? How would you sell your shares in a brokerage account? What would you do? Tell my financial advisor to sell Oh wow, he's fancy, he's got a financial advisor. I have like Charles Schwab, right? I'm just gonna log in and say, sell 10 shares, GE, market. Boom, they're gone. How hard was that? I don't have to go door to door knocking, asking people if they'd be interested in buying shit, 10 shares of GE. I didn't even have to engage a broker to do that for me. It's just so easy. So the ownership transfer is very, very easy. Is there perpetual succession? Absolutely. Um, I'm not sure what the oldest corporation is, but I know of one Scottish bank that lived to be at least 500 years old, and if it hadn't been for a trader in a back room in Singapore, they'd still be around, right? Because he'd made a bad trade and destroyed the company. So there is perpetual succession. Uh, in fact, the corporation is a legal person. The corporation is a legal person. It has all the rights and obligations of a person, uh, and it also can do something that people cannot do in a physical sense, and that is live forever. We all have limited, finite lifespans. Corporations don't. They could go on, theoretically, could go on forever. Is it easy for corporations to raise money? Oh yeah, let's start with um, going back to the banker. The banker who told my student not to let the door hit him on the way out, do you think if Tim Cook showed up, he would be so rude to Tim? By the way, do you know who Tim Cook is? Head of Apple, right? If Tim Cook showed up, do you think, how do you think he would treat Tim Cook? Mr. Cook, come in, have a seat. We know well, there's a law against indoor smoking, but in your case, we'll make an exception. Would you like a cigar? Here's some brandy. Let's talk business. What can I do for you today? Do you hear the market difference between get, get, get out and, and have a brandy, right? Big difference. Also, getting money from banks is easier. And also, because it's a corporation, they can issue shares. This is the first form of business where we've seen that there can be external equity. People uh, that are from the outside that have absolutely nothing else to do with the company are buying shares in it, providing equity capital. And so not only can you raise bank debt easier, you can raise equity capital. This is the first time we've seen that. And then also you can do something called issuing bonds, which is, so bond, or stocks are public equity, bonds are public debt. This is where you're basically just borrowing money from members of the public, those people who buy your bonds. That's how you're borrowing that money. Okay, now some of these things are good, some of these things are not. Oh, let's talk about easy to start. Uh, it's the hardest of all. 
because you have to have your articles of incorporation and you are under a stricter uh, frequency of review and regulation. Uh, so for instance, I've had my LLC for like three years now. I'm supposed to have filed some like yearly report, yearly some or other report. I haven't done it. Do you think they showed up at my house with handcuffs? No. Uh, but with corporations, they're far more picky about making sure that you submit your paperwork. Okay. Now, so far, the good things about this are the limited liability, the easy ownership transfer, the perpetual succession, the easy capital raising. It's harder to start, and then you've got this double taxation thing. And so, here's what I would tell you. How do I make the decision to go from an LLC to a corporation? The answer has to do with what are your growth opportunities? What are your growth opportunities? If I can easily, or me or my partners, if we can easily finance the growth opportunities with our current sources of capital, we should not form a corporation because we're going to then be uh, ex uh, putting ourselves in for this, um, this heightened amount of taxation and this heightened re reporting requirement. We don't want to do that. So why then would you jump to corporation? And the answer is, if the growth opportunities exceed our ability to finance them with our current sources of capital, if our growth opportunities exceed our current ability to finance those growth opportunities with our current sources of capital. And I'm gonna give you a little example here. And of course, it's kind of a faked up example, but you know the company. Are you familiar with Facebook? Yeah, your grandma's probably on it, and you're probably on Instagram, and you didn't even realize that's part of Facebook, but you know, whatever. Okay, so way back when, let's say that there are two partners in Facebook. One of them is named Mark Zuckerberg, and the other one is named Fred. I, I just made Fred up, right? Okay, each one of them owns 50%. That means that they both get 50% of the proceeds from Facebook. Now, down the road, they realize that Facebook is, getting, uh, is growing really fast and they can't afford all the servers and whatever they need in order to grow Facebook. So they have to go outside to look for capital. And at that point, they make the decision to become a corporation, even though they're going to have basically higher taxes and they've got this other stuff. That all has to be worth it because the gains from becoming a corporation exceed those additional costs. So, I'll give you an example of how this works. Um, you, you go to a pizza shop, and, and I hate this, when I'm standing in line at like Godfather's Pizza, and there are these three pans nailed to the wall, and you can see them, small, medium, large, probably extra large too. And the person in front of me is trying to decide whether to order a small or a, yeah, small or a medium. And the dumb question that they ask is, how many pieces is that? You see why that's a dumb question? Like, I can cut that thing into as many pieces as you want, right? It's still the same amount of pizza. Now, here's the thought with Mark and Fred. They've got a small pizza right now, and they each have half of that small pizza. After they do an IPO, they're going to IPO half the company. And so now they're going to be 50% of the shares held by outsiders, 25% by Mark, and 25% by Fred. 25% of the new larger pizza is more than 50% of the smaller pizza. That's why you become a corporation because this money that you're bringing in allows you to enlarge the corporation so much that even though you own now a smaller portion of it, you are still better off. Does that make sense? Would you ever want to become a corporation if you didn't have to for the capital? My answer is no, unless you're trying to swindle external investors. I have an uncle, well, I had, he's dead now, um, and he was a bit of a criminal. He was starting a business, and at first he tried to issue shares and sell them to people he knew. And although they loved the man, they knew he was a criminal, right? So they wouldn't buy the shares in his company. So then he went on to be an LLC. That story ends with him becoming bankrupt, stealing a welder and escaping to Mexico and living out his days in Puerto Vallarta. True story. That is not bullshit. All that is absolutely true. 
Okay. Should you want to be a corporation? Why, you, why would you want to be a corporation? So you have limited liability. Okay, limited liability, but I can get that with LLC. Yeah. All right? So there has to be more. Easy capital raising. Yeah, it's for the easy capital raising. And if you don't have the need for that easy capital, you don't want to be a corporation. Yeah. Any questions? Okay.